Today we're going to look at the stability of the nucleus and what happens when a nucleus is not stable. So keep in mind, when we're looking at nuclear decay, we're focusing on the nucleus of the atom. And the nucleus of the atom, as a reminder, is the center of the atom. It's where the protons and the neutrons are found, whereas outside of the nucleus, we have the electrons that are found in those energy levels or the electron cloud. But we're really focusing on the center, the nucleus. So in the nucleus, we have our protons. And protons are positive subatomic particles. And we also have our neutrons, or our neutral subatomic particles. Now the reason that these are so important is because we want a nucleus that is stable. We want the nucleus to be able to sustain itself without kind of blowing apart. But in order for that to happen, then the proton to neutron ratio has to be appropriate. The reason that that is, is because we know that positives, if left by themselves, well, they have like charges, and like charges repel or push away from each other. So if all you had was a bunch of positive subatomic particles, or the protons, then the nucleus itself would be unstable and it would decay rapidly. But if we have just the right amount of protons and just the right amount of neutrons, then our ratio can be fairly stable, which means the isotope can exist for longer. So when we're considering whether our isotope is stable, we're focusing on the number of protons. And the first thing we need to consider is, are there less than 83 protons? 83 is kind of a number where we have drawn the line of stability. Anything with more than 83 protons, that's bismuth and beyond, just has so many positive-positive interactions that the number of neutrons can't overcome them to allow the nucleus to stick together. Now bismuth does have an isotope that is fairly stable. It has a long life or half life is what we would consider, but it will eventually decay. So 83 and beyond we consider not stable. We then look at the band of stability, which is our proton to neutron ratio. And in order to figure out our band of stability, one thing we can do is count our subatomic particles. So here we have one, two, three, four, five. That's five protons, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven neutrons. So that's a five to seven ratio. Now in order to figure out if five to seven is within our one to one, all the way through one to 1 1.5, we really just need to take both these numbers divided by the smallest. So five divided by five, obviously one, and then seven divided by five, that's going to be 1.4. So our proton to neutron ratio is 1 to 1.4, which is within our band of stability of 1 to 1 through 1 to 1.5 proton to neutron ratio. And then the last thing we consider is whether the actual number of protons and neutrons is an odd number or an even number. And really, even tends to be more stable. So if you're comparing two isotopes and trying to figure out whether it's more stable than another, then if you have one isotope that has an even number of protons and neutrons, then that's more likely to be stable. Here we had an odd number of each, five and seven. So this would be less stable than some of the other isotopes of, well, we've got one, two, three, four, five protons, so this is boron. This is gonna be less stable than maybe another isotope that had even even, but it definitely is within our band of stability and it has much less than 83 protons. So it is fairly likely to be stable. Remember, unstable isotopes, 83 or more protons, so really big nuclei, outside the band of stability, so the ratio, it comes either higher or lower than 1.5 or 1 to 1, and it's going to have odd numbers of protons and or odd numbers of neutrons. So of all of these, I would say that this one would be less stable than many other isotopes because it has a fairly high ratio, which for the smaller atoms, they tend to be closer to the one-to-one -one side, and it had the odd numbers of both protons and neutrons. Anytime you have an unstable nucleus, it is going to be likely to break apart. And when it breaks apart, 
one of these type of particles are the most common to come off, and sometimes it's even more than one. So here we've got our alpha particles. An alpha particle is like a helium nucleus, so we have an atomic number of two and a mass number of four. And because it's like a nucleus, it doesn't have any electrons, it is charged, but to be honest with you, you're not going to really track charges when we're writing our statements. You could also have beta particles. Beta particles are kind of like a high-speed electron, so they have a mass number of zero. Their atomic number is negative one, which is really kind of strange, but they are also intermediate in strength, so they're in the middle. The reason that a beta is actually going to have a negative one atomic number goes back to what beta particles are actually going to be. When you have beta decay, what actually happens is one of these neutrons kind of almost like splits into a proton and electron. So a neutron in the nucleus turns into a proton, and then all that's kind of shot off there would be a really high speed electron. So the mass doesn't change because the neutron was already there and now it's just become a proton. And the proton number actually goes up by one, which is why the beta particle that got shot off is negative one. And then anytime you have alpha or beta decay or any of the other types of decay that are in your textbook, you're also gonna have some gamma energy that comes off. And this is really, really strong. So if we were thinking in terms of strength, alpha are incredibly weak, which means that if you hold up a piece of paper, you're actually going to block alpha particles because they can't penetrate through paper. Beta are in the middle. You would have to hold up a pretty thick like winter jacket, but that would be enough to block beta. The only thing that's gonna block gamma radiation are actually things like lead sheets, things that are incredibly dense. These are the particles that would actually interfere with the growth of your cells, which is why gamma is what really would cause cancer and also all kinds of nuclear burns and things. So we're looking at these type of, of particles being the ones that you need to memorize. These are the ones that you have to learn. But there are other types available that if I wanted you to think in terms of any of those other types of particles, I would tell you what the symbol is. So now that we have an idea of the actual strength and the stability of our nucleus, let's look in terms of what we're going to do with these problems. So if I were to give you an isotope, something like a americium-235, we're going to look at the nuclear symbol of that. I could give you this nuclear symbol and say, do you feel this is stable? Why or why not? So the first thing that you could consider is just the number of protons and neutrons. The number of protons is incredibly easy to figure out because that's your atomic number. So protons are 95. To figure out our neutrons, we need to subtract our mass number from our atomic number. So 235 minus 95, that gives us a total of 140. So we have a 95 to 140 ratio. Now, in terms of stability, 95 is much greater than 83. So we already know right out the cage here that this is not going to be stable. This is too large of an atomic number. It's bigger than 83, so it's not stable. The other thing we could look at very easily is whether these are odd and even numbers. Remember, even numbers are more stable. So 140 neutrons, that helps, but because we have 95 protons, that's an odd number. So again, two strikes, not stable. The other thing that we could consider after we look at those two is this actual ratio. If we divide each of these numbers by 95, we get a one to 1.47 proton to neutron ratio, which would actually fall in an appropriate spot of the band of stability. This is a heavy nucleus, so we would be wanting to be close to the 1 to 1.5 ratio. But again, since the ratio was the only thing that had, this had going on in terms of stability, we would still say that this is probably not going to be a stable isotope. Let's do one more practice like that. Let's look at bismuth 212. So that's 212 for the mass number, 83 for our atomic number, 
And then our symbol would just be bismuth Bi. Is this stable? Well, 83 is the cutoff line. So really isn't going to be stable because it is still so large. But we did say that there was one isotope of bismuth that had a fairly long half-life only because it was so close. So let's go ahead and look at the other things. We're going to figure out the number of protons. That's 83. And the number of neutrons. Well, 212 minus 83. That's 129. This is an odd number. This is an odd number. So still not looking good for bismuth. Two odd numbers, fairly unlikely that that would be a stable isotope. And of course, the last thing we can do is look at our ratio by dividing both of those by the smaller number. Now we've got a one to 1.55 ratio. This is definitely bigger than the 1.5 cutoff in our band of stability. So three strikes, definitely not going to be stable. Anytime you have an isotope like bismuth-212 that is not stable, the other thing that I could ask you to do is look at what it forms when it does decay through one of those particles. So if we start again with 212 over 83 bismuth, I could say to you, what would be produced if bismuth-212 decays through alpha radiation? And what you would need to do is write me an equation. We use this yield arrow to separate our reactants, the things we start with, and our products, the things we end with. And since I specified that I wanted to look at, say, alpha radiation, you would have to know to write down our nuclear symbol yields and then an alpha particle. And you can use the 4 over 2 alpha or the 4 over 2 He, since it is like a helium nucleus, I'd be okay either way, plus, and then what we write here, this is going to be the nuclear symbol of the atom that's left behind when the alpha particle is emitted. Now really, you just need to think of this in terms of an equation, where our yield sign is like an equal sign. So what plus 4 gives you 212, or 212 minus what, or minus 4 gives you what. So 208 plus 4 equals 212. That mass number is now 208. And then similarly, what plus 2 gives you 83, that's going to be 81. And since it's no longer 83, it's no longer bismuth, so you would look up on the periodic table and realize that your symbol is now TL, so that would be thallium. When bismuth-212 decays through alpha decay, you are going to have an atom of thallium-208 as your resulting product. 208 plus 4 is 212, 81 plus 2 is 83. We could do the exact same thing for bismuth, but this time I could have specified that I wanted you to use beta decay. And if I tell you in the problem to use beta, then you're going to have to know that beta is 0 8 over negative 1 with the beta sign, or again, you could just use an electron since that's what a beta is like, plus, and now we just need to fill in the box. Now this one's a little different because it's a negative one. So algebraically, what plus negative one gives you 83? This actually goes up to 84. And then what plus zero gives you 212? Well, that stays 212. We look up atomic 84, and atom 84 would be polonium. That's PO. So our resulting nucleus here would be within an atom of polonium. The last thing that I could really ask you to do after you write these equations would be to calculate your ratios of protons to neutrons to see if it actually improved or if it got worse. So remember our 83 to 12 bi, we said that when we subtracted these and then divided by 83, we started with a ratio of one 
to 1.55. That was our initial ratio. Now we could check each of these ratios and see if they got better or worse. So again, we take 208 minus 81, divided by 81, and for the first one, this ratio now winds up being 1 to 1.57. It actually went even higher. It was already outside the band of stability, and now it's even further from the band of stability. So this one actually got worse. It's less stable than the initial one. Whereas here, if we take 212 minus 84, and then divide it by 84, our new ratio is now 1 to 1.52. Still not quite within the band of stability since the cutoff is at 1.5, but it's definitely moving in the right direction. So this one got better, it became more stable. One last note of clarification for you before we go. Anytime you have alpha or beta decay, you're also going to get small amounts of gamma radiation, which is why even though we said that this is incredibly weak and this is kind of in the middle, because these strong types of energy also come off with the alpha and beta particles, that's why nuclear decay can be dangerous if you're in an environment with a large enough amount of it going on. But please keep in mind, you do have some of these types of decay coming off of atoms all around you all the time. So it's not like saying that every type of nuclear decay is so incredibly dangerous that we're all going to wind up forming cancer or we're all going to wind up with radioactive poisoning. Small amounts are okay, your cells can handle that. It's just when you're in an environment with really large amounts of this gamma radiation that comes off with our alpha and beta decay, that's when things could be a problem. Let me know if you have any questions about alpha, beta, gamma decay, or anything about nuclear stability. Remember, just continue to communicate with me.